EFP Toz Leopard. Hmm. That's interesting. I don't know how an apple could get up here. Yeah, what was the theme for today, Adam? Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I was thinking, uh, again, I was, I mean, there's so many things that, that AI and AGI and then sapient AGI would change. It, it, it's, it's tempting to say, well, absolutely everything and we can't, and therefore we can't know anything. This is, this is a, this is a, a sore temptation to do that. I mean, and just, I'm sympathetic to that to some extent, right? I mean, the, the 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 singularity metaphor is resonates for a reason. I mean, so many assumptions that we make about the world today will be undermined or obviated or 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 otherwise um, cast into doubt by this incredible new technology. But to an extent, you could say that for every new technology that has any disruptive potential at all. I mean, it's difficult to say where. The, the changes that, that a new technology will cause will stop and, and, and what might remain the same, what might be different. Okay, well, with all of that in mind, um, uh, I thought it might be fun to, to uh, say, okay, well, I'm sure we're going, it, and I get it's very difficult to way, down and think through <laughs> all of the possible changes that might occur. But it's nevertheless <laughs> interesting and useful to think, yeah, try to think cool. through some of them. And yeah, it's definitely part of what my team does when we look at a disruption is we try to yeah, identify you know, that major <laughs> implications. Yeah, as soon as we um, not all of which are necessarily more. obvious. Uh, you you do have to think quite carefully, um, and it's impossible to, to 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 think of everything. Even the very largest, most profound changes that, that do occur are not necessarily obvious in advance. They're in some sense quite emergent. Um, and so the, the consequences, the implications of disruptive technological change tend to surprise us. They, 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 uh, they're seldom easily predictable. Uh, but one of the things that I was thinking about is the little things that change. So it's one thing to, be, to always be focused on the big things, like what are the big things that are going to change? What are the major shifts? What are the, what are the, the profound transformations that are likely to result in transportation being completely automated or energy being uh, clean as in no carbon footprint and also very inexpensive, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, but these little changes, what about the little things? Like, if, and, and so I, I, uh, I was just, I don't know, I think I was driving in my car or something like that. I was just, you know, I had a few minutes to myself to just kind of think and I was thinking about just little stuff, like what small things did the internet change? The internet changed plenty of big things. I mean, you know, the, the, these very high level transformations and impacts, yes, we can, we can all sort of easily identify those, especially in retrospect. But lots of little things changed with the internet, the rise of the internet as well. Um, and uh, we mentioned one of those examples in the previous session. We said, you know, oh, isn't it funny that, that movie plots and television plots used to involve the character struggling to get to a telephone, you know, um, or to have some piece of information that they, 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 you know, they didn't have. And that's, of course, a very, very old storytelling device that goes back, you know, to classical antiquity. That the absence of information um, or the difference, the asymmetry of information between characters is a great plot device, right? It's easy to drive plot uh, forward with storytelling if the characters don't know, don't all know absolutely everything. Okay. Um, so I, it was just a little example of, a, you know, the, the, the internet changed little things we take for granted, like, like um, in the old days, we couldn't, it wasn't easy to um, get in touch with anybody any way, any time you wanted. And so fun, little, there were little funny things, like how children played was very different. You know, if you wanted to go and meet your friends somewhere, you had to make arrangements in advance, and then you had to, you know, you had to be responsible enough and reliable enough to actually be where you said you were going to be and meet them there. Um, and if you didn't, or if not everybody showed up, well, you just had to roll with it. You, you know, you, 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 you couldn't let life grind to a halt because you weren't able to get in touch with somebody, for example. Uh, so, yeah, I, remember, um, I was I remember trying to think, okay, well, what are these little changes that could change? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just a small anecdote. I remember that transition where, I guess it was in high school uh, for me, where people started getting mobile phones. Um, so it was 
at some point a social norm that yeah you made plans beforehand you talked to everybody who was going to be there you arranged a time and then you all just showed up and I, I clearly remember the kind of tipping point where it shifted to a new equilibrium of you know plans shifting at the last minute being recalibrated and if you it was actually one of the kind of reasons to have a phone have a mobile was that uh, if you if you couldn't participate in that reevaluation, you, you just kind of um, it wasn't really an option socially to not be uh, amenable to update in, in that way. Yeah, that's really interesting. That 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 I suppose that there was a probably in any given location, like any given region or city or, or country, depending on exactly when the mobile phone uh, rollout really, really, you know, uh, really took off. And exactly how old you are, where you would be in, in your life, you could easily remember, you know, probably a, a one year or maybe a two year period where that transformation happened. For me, that uh, because partly because of where I was living, I was living in a less developed country for high school. Um, uh, and, and partly because I, uh, probably my age, um, the mobile phone transformation didn't happen until my second year of university. Um, I remember that quite vividly um, when I went back to the, the the city that I'd gone to high school in, um, in Oman. Um, uh, you know, one year nobody had any mobile phones, and the next year everybody had them. Everybody. It was an amazing transformation. It was very, very, very sudden. And part some of that was was access access to the phones themselves and the affordability of them. And I think a large portion of it was the infrastructure. The infrastructure had to be um, built out. Um, and so those two things had to happen simultaneously. And then a lot of, as you said, lots of little changes occurred in people's lives. Um, well, one example that I mentioned, I'll, I'll talk about it here uh, to kick off the conversation. And I mentioned it to you, Dan, offline, which is um, uh, with artificial intelligence, a lot of human limitations, a lot of limitations on, um, on the labor that we do uh things that translate into co a, co a cost in terms of time or effort or you know financial cost are a function of human limitations and you know artificial intelligence and machine labor will transcend will, will exceed many of those limitations um in 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 different ways and it might be fun to think through some of this some of the little implications the little things that that might result in that. Uh, I don't know how to do how to think through this methodically. Maybe we can maybe we can focus on trying to come up with a method for examining the small stuff methodically, and then uh, uh, try to think through a few examples. I'm not again. I'm not exactly sure how to do this, but I'll share one example I thought of, which is um, I'm, as I look around myself, even just sitting here at my desk, there are lots of little items, little plastic widgets and metal widgets and pieces, bits and pieces of electronics, and there's a pair of scissors, and there there are there's a stapler with staples inside it, and there are um, various electronics, you know, plugs and adapters and that sort of thing. Um, uh, there's a coffee cup here with a lid on it, and so forth. And some of the products around me are very high quality. They're made really well. They really work well. They perform very well. And it's clear that they're made to a very high tolerance. You know, they're just just the precision with which they're manufactured is very high, and the design that's gone into them was very thoughtful. And so as a result, they work really well. Uh, but, but the things that, the, the, and there isn't a perfect correlation here, but there's a strong correlation between how much these, these little widgets around me cost and how well they work. And I have a lot of cheap junk around within arm's reach as well. And the differences between the cheap stuff and the expensive stuff are the physical differences are tiny. And, and I know things that have to be made to a high tolerance if they are to function as machines. But it seems to me strange, like how hard, how much harder is it to make a staple that fits in a stapler and doesn't get stuck uh, than it is to make a staple that's, that, that's just crappy enough to get stuck and not quite work. And I encounter many, many things in life. Like how, how hard is it to make a coffee cup lid on a, you know, a travel coffee mug that doesn't leak that actually just that just works right um does it really quadruple the cost to get the the the, the machining and the precision uh 
correct there. And and so as I and I encourage you to do the same. Look around yourself or cast your mind around um, and think of the just little things that are kind of an, like why does this break or why does this thing just not work as well as it could? Why is a rubbish a cheap pen not as good as an expensive one? Or a, a, you know. Um, uh, a, 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 like a, a flash, I've got a flashlight here, a torch, as you guys might say. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's, it does not screw, the, the end the cap that screws down to press the battery contact into place uh, is not quite aligned well enough and isn't quite long enough, and the spring isn't quite strong enough, and the threading on the screw uh, is not quite long enough to actually screw it all the way down so that it makes a good contact and doesn't flicker. And so as a result, this flashlight flickers a bit unless I absolutely mash, it, mash and crank down the, the end cap. And it would be such a trivial thing to do better and to have really work. Um, but, and yet there's cheapness. So, what, what is, so why is it? So anyway, the, I'm just giving examples. The, my thought was, well, I wonder if a lot of it has to do with the accumulation of the cost throughout the supply chain uh, and, and all of the capital behind the manufacturer of each of these little widgets, um, the cost of precision in terms of the attention that they take, like the attention to detail. So in, in so many jobs, so many forms of human labor, you can do a really conscientious, thoughtful, careful job and really do it right or you can do a half-assed job, a sloppy job, and not do it very well. And what I'm thinking is that if 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 you if enough of those if enough of the high cost of attention to detail accumulates, then you get parts that don't quite fit together because they're made by machines that aren't quite calibrated as well as they should be because they're made those machines are in turn made from parts that aren't you know quite as high quality as they could be, and what is what is what's going on that determines at least some of that at every step? Well, at least I mean some of it may be just genuinely just the raw materials and so forth, but a lot of it is just the effort and the time and the care that human labor puts into every single little step in the chain, right? Every single little step of the way, and there are some cultures where, and I, Japan is an example of a culture historically. I, I don't know what contemporary J Japanese culture is like to such an extent, but there. A little, if you go back a little ways in, into history, uh, J Japan is a, an example of a culture that is renowned for attention to detail. Tiny little things are given attention to detail that don't receive attention to de detail in other cultures. And you can see that in many of the sort of uh, physical artifacts of Japanese culture, like the way that cookies are wrapped, just wrapped, just how they're wrapped totally different a japanese product than a product from india for example um, or the united states and i'm i've always been struck by the incredible attention to detail in many japanese products okay this is one example well that strikes me as something that is a distinctly human limitation and paying attention and being careful and thoughtful and conscientious is 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 not just time consuming it is for human beings but it's absolutely exhausting. It takes so much, so much more effort uh, 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 um, cognitively, not physically necessarily, a little bit more effort physically, but massively more effort cognitively to pay very close attention and do a very careful and thoughtful job of something, especially something that is boring or uh, frustrating or repetitive and and you know characterized by toil and drudgery, and so uh, it, it it it's it it what what might the I mean it seems like a very small thing and not obvious at all but it, but it might be quite profound. What struck me is that man machines are just going to they're not going to have that problem at all. They will they will uh, not suffer the difficulty of. Uh, attending to detail. They will simply do the best job that they can to whatever level of detail they are capable of achieving, but they will achieve that with more or less the same consistency. I mean, I, I hesitate to use the word perfect consistently, but they, perfect consistency. But my, my impression is that machines will simply achieve that level of detail and precision every time, or more or less every time. 
within some margin of error. And and that it won't be it won't be they won't experience the same sort of difficulties that we do that translate into failures of attending to detail. And um, as a result, one could imagine that all of the failures associated with uh, <laughs> or many of the failures associated with sloppy work of which there are, I mean, geez, countless cumulative examples everywhere around us um, uh, as a result of human labor, those could just, I mean, those would just be, they would be, they would vanish, they would be gone, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they would cease to exist. And what would the world look like if everything were uh, built with the meticulousness and the attention to detail um, that an app that Apple products are made with, for example, um, as opposed to cheap electronics uh, by comparison. So anyway, that was just it was. I, I, I apologize for being long-winded about it. I, I don't have a very succinct way of articulating um, what I'm really, you know, the, the the this general concept in the abstract here. Uh, maybe you can help me turn this from some specific example into a more general set of ideas and principles at work here. Yeah, maybe I'll take a stab at the general comment and then I'll push Matt to explain his um, dissent there. Uh, so uh, I was thinking about this before the seminar. Um, I think there are many examples of uh, we take human limitations as somehow more fundamental, like uh, being related to or so artifacts of our experience or our world that are consequences of human limitation. We, we can instead think about them as really properties of the world rather than we kind of externalize our limitations and uh, and take them as kind of facts about the world and not just consequences of our shortcomings. Um, uh, let's, so I, I guess I could give some more examples, but um, so I think the, to, to come back to the sort of the reason you were introducing this topic, so there can be you're looking for subtle examples of things that will surprise us. And I think maybe there are, there's a whole category of such things which, is, which are of the following form. So because of some human limitation, uh, maybe let's take the game of Weichi or, or Go, for example. Uh, because of human limitations, we might think that the... Uh, we might think that our kind of style of playing Go or our achievements are somehow not just... Uh, not just properties of us, but we can think about them as being properties of the game, right? We can think about our limits as somehow being limits, not somehow things that are specific to us, or overinterpret our ideas about the game as being somehow properties of the game itself rather than just our perspective on the game. Um, and when along comes, say, a technology like AI or these other examples of disruptions that uh, we can be shocked into realizing that this phenomena that we were projecting onto the world and thinking about as a property of the world is really just a function of our flaws and our limitations. And this confronting this gap uh, is, is kind of a continual source of surprise for us. I'm trying to think of, I mean, maybe one example is the way we thought about the world before fast travel, right? Um, so we had maps with large gray areas on them, and we kind of thought about the unknown, the unknown status of the world as sort of being a property of the world, right? It was obviously a function of our ignorance, but maybe unless we were paying close attention to that fact, we... We often thought about it. We, we thought there were literally dragons there, right? <laughs> that the dragon is a thing out there in the world that lurks in the unknown, or the Bermuda Triangle, or, or maybe now the example is UFOs or something like that. Uh, we externalize our state of knowledge and think about it as actually being an objective fact about the world. And once we explore more, that goes away. And the world, of course, didn't change really once we explored it, unless we changed it. You know, if we're just flying planes over it and mapping it, it didn't change. But somehow we were quite shocked to come across a, a world that was explored that feels very different. Whereas, in fact, the world didn't 
change. So maybe that's a kind of general framing that I would put on some of these examples. Maybe it doesn't work for all of them. Uh, but having said that, Matt, do you want to explain what your comment on this first example was? The um, examples are good. I like the staple example. I have an example where um, I've been through many third party aftermarket uh, charges for my laptop since I've got this laptop about 10 years ago. And they don't last anywhere near as long as the original Apple one. And I think it's a mix of um, the quality of the electrical components inside the charger and the, the soldering and the wiring and the circuit board and stuff. Um, and like the quality of the, the connections, they maybe aren't as secure and robust. So um, these chargers last noticeably shorter and actually the recently i've been um i've been uh buying a new charger and then it hasn't lasted even a few weeks and I'm, I'm, i don't know what to do now because i can't really keep buying chargers. buy an official charger <laughs> well that's one option I, yeah, but it's, it's much more expensive um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> at some point you're going to go through more money worth of I, knock yeah. off chargers than a new laptop too <laughs> I, yeah well that's true yeah. yeah i should buy a new laptop anyway um yeah i don't know if the electrical components is attention to detail but maybe it is maybe it's also materials i don't really understand exactly enough about the details of manufacturing these like capacitors and, and stuff um, um but i wonder how that these companies cut their costs whether it's attention to detail or whether it's um material like the quality of the materials they're using so if it was the quality of the materials then i can see that as like a, a different kind of uh skimping that makes them kind of you know you can't visibly detect the difference but it's not one of these uh attention to detail uh corner cutting cases like uh what adam was talking about um so yeah i'm not, I'm not sure about that maybe there are other ways cheap things are cheap um but my main stumbling point was was when you said adam that um that these machines that we build these like if we build um ais or whatever that are able to do this kind of design work and stuff um they will be uh able they will have some unlimited resource of attention span and patience and, and diligence that is required to do this kind of work like uh because i kind of think there's a reason why humans don't have that um except for virtuous humans um who are you know embody these um qualities and, and perhaps the japanese who embody these qualities of patience and and attention to detail um that you know it costs money to to spend electricity um and so i'm just not sure that we end up in a world where it's much different um like we're going to come up against the same costs but then uh but at a higher I, level I of quality a counterpoint maybe i can anticipate a counterpoint which is that um once energy becomes abundant um it may be difficult to scale kind of cognitive um energy in humans but not so hard to scale the um the amount of attention we can um we can budget for with our machines so yeah maybe that's a counterpoint to to my maybe spell check is an example in that direction i mean for a human spelling correctly is a matter of attention partly just knowing how to spell but even once you know how to spell at any given margin there's an error rate and you can pay attention or not and correct those errors or not yeah thinking through the point you just made Matt, in production lines maybe at a given level of expenditure on materials there's uh an also uh, amount of resources you can spend on attention so if you're manuf manufacturing electronics i guess it's it's assumed that the people say a uh, inserting components into a circuit board say it's assumed they will make mistakes uh, and then there's an error correction and QA process that attempts to correct those errors so there's maybe two separate investments you can make you can invest in the training and the 
rate of production. I mean, you can lower the rate of production. So less components go past the people on the production line and therefore they have more time per component. Or you can spend more money on training, I guess, although maybe that's at a certain point doesn't help. Uh, and you could also spend more time on correcting errors, so a more robust QA process. I assume that when we talk about Apple's quality, it's partly in intelligence required to design the product in the first place so that it is easy to manufacture at a higher level of quality. Uh, perhaps that's part of it. But it's probably also better training at the Foxconn factories, for example, um, maybe more time for the workers and maybe a, in particular a more robust QA process. But I don't know much about it, but I would expect actually that the easiest thing to scale with capital is the QA process. So maybe Apple just tests more and rejects more. Uh, so yeah, I don't know that really yeah. the, the margin that they spend money on is, is attention, but I could imagine that uh, that's more just to do with, as Adam says, human limitations. So there's there's only so much you can do to improve the quality of production of a, a sort of an individual on a production line. Um, okay, so I, 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 this doesn't get me past um, like um, using robots in the production line. Like you, you. Uh, a robot that is, uh, be it, you know, on a production line of words through your document and it's spell checking each of them, or it's circuit boards on a conveyor belt and it's inserting the components and soldering them with, you know, mechanical precision. And then I get you, yeah, this thing is like infinitely patient in the same way that a computer can just, you can just tell it to add numbers and the, the CPU will just go around in a loop all day and it won't get bored. But we're talking about, like AI and disruption in the future. So um, when you design the hard part about getting to that stage where you have a precise machine that carries out your process to a really good quality is designing the me like mechanizing that process. That's hard that there's room for humans who are doing that to make errors. Um, but if, but if you, you, this is not really the same thing. The thing that you get at the end, this sort of fixed narrow, intelligent machine that is very good at a particular task and can do it repetitively and is infinitely patient. It's not the same thing as like an AGI, for example, which um, I mean, maybe with advances in, in AI that are coming in, in the near future, we can do things like, I, I believe uh, sewing, sewing garments is really tricky to automate with machines because uh, the garments are kind of really difficult to work with mechanically because they're kind of unpredictable, hard to model. Um, the, the fabric and stuff. Uh, and so that's why we have um, countries where um, clothing is made um, by, by human seamstresses, um, largely. Um, but maybe with advances in reinforcement learning, we actually are able to build a robot that can uh, deftly handle um, fabric and, you know, we, we automate that as well. Um, but it's, that, that's, yeah, okay, I can see that kind of advance coming, but if we're talking about, are we talking about AGI? Are we talking about putting uh, a factory full of um, Asimov-style, you know, humanoid robots that have an AGI um, and standing them all in a line and, they, and then they all work on the production line where we could have had humans standing in a line? That seems to be then, like, it's not clear that you get... Um, attention in that scenario yeah maybe maybe that's another maybe that's a good example of a limitation uh, of humans that has dictated our industrial processes so humans find it so hard to quickly do tasks that are complex that we have arranged an industrial production line that divides a complex task into a hundred simple tasks which can then be performed reliably or relatively reliably and quickly by human labor. Uh, maybe that's one of the assumptions that the assumption being that's the only way to produce a complex object at large scale for low cost. Uh, if the individual pieces, namely the humans, uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty of room for machines to be, uh, to make quick decisions that are much more complex than we are capable of doing quickly and without getting tired, right? So at the moment, say you're producing a circuit board 
Uh, you would have the basic circuit board and then you would plug various bits into it and the, the people on the production line probably as I meant to, they take a component off the production line, they should examine it to see if it's like physically defective and pick up another one if they do discern that. Uh, plug it in, maybe do some simple checks to see that they plugged it in correctly and then pass it on to the next station. Um, if the individual can make much more complicated decisions at speed, uh, then the decisions required for that step, you could have more complicated steps and you would divide the production process differently. So maybe that's in itself a um, an assumption. Yeah, it's not clear to me that the the um, AGI in a humanoid um, robot form is that much better at um, context switching and making, you know, doing a complex task um, because we pay for those things cognitively for a reason. I don't quite understand the full reason, but it's the same as with attention. Like it's kind of costing cognitive resources. So, but that seems more to do yeah, with the, this the is, power budget of a, a brain than to do with some fundamental maybe. information theoretic limits, I would say. Yeah, that was going to be a question I would ra was going to raise. Um, uh, I'll try to remember to come back to that when Matt is finished. The, the, just the, how little we understand about how these things actually are ha happening and working in the brain. Yeah, well, I would, I would distill my point to something like, um, we don't know what AGI is going to look like. There's kind of a chance that when we build AGI, um, a lot of these things that we think are going to go away because it's a machine actually come back because it's an intelligent machine and they're kind of fundamental to intelligence. And I, I don't really yeah. stand behind that with a lot of weight, but that's, that's my point. And attention might be one of those things. And then Dan's example of kind of complex context switching and stuff. Uh, would be another one of those things where I'd be like, uh, well, what if that comes back? And I'm not saying that it will, but. Well, know, just to take a, well. a specific example. So uh, one of the places AI computer vision in particular is being applied uh, quite extensively is in maintaining infrastructure. So maintenance. So one of the, there's actually a startup in Melbourne that's providing software to the Australian government for maintaining power lines, I believe. So you take photos of power boxes along you know, the, at the moment, there's a lot of human, very low level human labor involved in maintaining power lines. People drive around, they look at the power boxes. Is that blown up or as a, otherwise somehow needs maintenance? No, you move on to the next one. You look at it. Uh, now they take photos or the drones take photos and they upload it to a system that just runs it through a confinet and answers yes or no for this needing further attention. That's an example of a task that humans would quickly get tired at. There's only so many pictures. I mean, it takes time to move from box to box. There's only so many you want to look at. And you, like you, you even structure your infrastructure. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of infrastructure that's built in a certain way because that's the only way that it's actually possible to maintain it with human labor at a given cost, right? You don't, uh, you don't build exposed objects that are vulnerable to wear and tear uh, all over the place if you don't have the labor to go and look at them and fix them if they fail. And we just take that for granted in our infrastructure all over the place. I would imagine that as these tools like convnets and drones for taking photos and feeding that back to systems that then send out either robots or humans to fix things, once we get much better at that, we will build infrastructure differently in ways that would look mm. profligate and like just inviting disaster today because you would just look at it and think there's no way we could send out thousands of people to fix all that if it fails, but we'll just accept the failures and send the robots to fix it. Okay. You're back. I was, then I'll just, I'll just wrap up. I was just going to say um, that, yeah, that sounds like a good example. And um, Cognets and drones, are they, are we viewing those as like a disruption in process? Like the, the, the application of these technologies that are worked out in academia and are being uh, like they're, they're on the deployment roadmap um, to, you know, the rest of the way we do everything. Well, those examples are already deployed. Yeah, I, I don't know to what scale, but it's already deployed, yeah.
yeah i i can see more things like that and then it's more like that that's like a that's like industrializing the maintenance of infrastructure right you, you're turning it into a production line that has automated components and um that's that that makes sense and i agree you can get more attention to detail in that mode um in that regime um and my, my concern is only in the well do we expect do we somehow expect infinitely more attention to detail from agis because we want to automate not only things that can be put into a production line but also things that kind of can't yeah i, I guess uh i wouldn't there will always be a frontier on which attention is relatively expensive uh maybe it's like <laughs> the dyson sphere construction is uh is cognitively demanding <laughs> uh but but maybe inside that front... actually sounds kind of simple <laughs> <laughs> okay well, very yeah. large scale thing of a kind of very simple you know you just bootstrap it with like some nanobots or something yeah then and, and solve solve all those complex uh <laughs> gravitational dynamical systems in order to stop it collapsing i, I think we can put you in charge then if you think it's easy <laughs> okay all right <laughs> yeah, okay no, there's, there's things like there's things like uh complex cognitive things like research i guess um you know seems to require there's not really many repetitive steps or something like everything is kind of new um yeah something like that did you have further comments on that item, or should we try for some other examples? Yeah, I had a, a just one quick thought, and I think it's something something comes out of it that might be interesting. Um, so, just the general comment first, and the specific. The general comment here, with respect to human beings, is that we we I think we still have only a fairly low resolution understanding of um, brain function, and as an extension of why we. Uh, fatigue the way that we do cognitively, uh, why attention feels subjectively the qualia of effortfulness and why that is uncomfortable under some circumstances, but not nearly so uncomfortable under other circumstances. So sometimes it feels more effortful to do something than, for example, that you're quote unquote bored or uninterested in than th that you are quote unquote interested in or excited about. We don't understand the interactions between motivation and interest and attention well at all, to, to my knowledge. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I think the, the 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 explanation at bottom is almost certainly something to do with energetics, right? I mean, calories were extremely difficult to obtain in our ancestral environment, and um, brains could only become so large uh, before they, you know, affected reproductive success and so we know our brains are very much energy economizing and there probably is at bottom some reason why uh you know evolution is pretty picky and, and i'm sure it, it, it we were subject to selection on the basis of um, our cognitive function being more energetically efficient in some way and then that, that is some sort of ultimate explanation but having said that um uh there are sort of Counterexample. So, so I have never done it myself personally, so I don't have personal experience. But my understanding is that there are a whole variety of, um, uh, you know, sort of amphetamine uh, family pharmaceuticals, um, uh, uh, Ritalin, and um, I forget what some of the other ones are, and they can make paying attention much less effortful. They can make it much easier to hear. Uh, I'm sorry, to to um, uh, to to. Um, stay focused basically on something than than would be the case normally. And my um, my understanding also, and this might get back to just sort of what general what what elements of, are required for sapient general intelligence. My understanding is that at least at least part of the theory behind uh, executive function is that it is that there's a lot of tasks switching and a lot of sort of metacognition thinking about your thinking that goes on. And so you're, you're um, one thing with paying attention, and it's possible that, the, that Ritalin and other pharmaceuticals kind of shortcut this process a bit, um, is that 
you, you it's, it's some part of your conscious uh, uh, awareness is more or less continuously returning to whatever it is you're doing and asking whether that's something that's still worth doing. And it's it's almost like a check, like a continuous check. Like you're doing something and then a, you know, a few seconds later, part of your mind is saying, is this still worth doing? And that, and then, you know, okay, it is. And you keep doing the task and then your mind returns. Is this still worth doing? And you keep, and we can feel pulled away from tasks. Um, if you, if you, if you, if you introspect, you can kind of feel that happening if you're trying to pay attention to something that you don't want to pay attention to. Um, and it's possible that, that all of that task switching and then the, the, the running that overarching metacognitive sort of executive layer that's sort of looking at all the different things you're doing and double checking in the moment whether they're still viable. Um, that's probably energetically costly. Um, and uh, if you just turn that off, then it's easy to kind of just focus on one thing and stay stuck there. And I think people who people have described it, that's a lot. That's what being on Ritalin can be like. Um, uh, and then you can suddenly find yourself having spent an hour um, monkeying around with your pencil or something and and uh, you didn't realize it. Uh, and so um, uh, because you're you shut off the metacognitive metacognition um, part of your brain a little bit. Anyway, so that's one thing. Sorry, uh, too long winded. The specific example that occurred to me where that might be interesting is where it interacts with physical fatigue, right? So your brain obviously is part of your physicality, but cognition, cognitive fatigue is different than sort of the fatigue of your of musculature, your sort of your skeletal systems fatigue, your fatigue of your of your muscles, um, you know, your tendons, your ligaments, your uh, your uh, nervous system, you know, all of that stuff fatigues as you're awake and eventually, you know, uh, becomes dysfunctional if you don't rest, and uh combine that fatigue with cognitive fatigue and then in, you sort of get a negative feedback loop where as you get more and more physically fatigued uh you know that your your mind is your brain is having to adapt so your body your body doesn't work identically when you're fresh as it does when you're tired and so as you fatigue your brain is having to adapt and do things differently so if you're sitting on a production line, the way you actually do the movements and the way you, you know, perform the tasks is going to differ at the beginning of your shift than at the end of your shift because your body physically changes and how it performs over that time. One would imagine that, that that may not be the case to nearly the same extent or even at all for machine labor. Right? Machine labor may not noticeably or significantly physically fatigue in any meaningful sense at all, in which case there need to be no cognitive adaptation to that fatiguing over the course of a work period. And again, so you can kind of see how this is a feedback loop. Anyway, um, uh, so there may be that sort of thing to think about as well for, you know, and, and, and again, like you were saying, Dan, we build consciously or not, we build systems, all systems today, all infrastructure, all manufacturing design, all roles and occupations, <laughs> pretty much everything I can think of is designed around those limits and around those constraints and around those, you know, um, uh, shortcomings and characteristics that human have. Hmm. I thought of an interesting example. It changes the subject a little. Um, so this is based on my experience of spending some time uh, in China and the pace of infrastructure development there. Um, so let's see, let me call it conservation by default. So one human limitation or the limitation of our current combination of, of machines and humans, perhaps, is the rate at which we can change the physical world, right? So it's difficult and expensive to, for example, get rid of a hill. Uh, we have to get bulldozers, uh, perhaps explosives. It takes coordinated labor of groups of people. It takes tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and then bye-bye hill or hello road or hello building. Uh, building anything substantial takes decades in Australia and months in China, but uh, even in China, you know, it's it's remarkable to see a city change significantly every year when you go back to visit it. But it's still a sort of bounded rate of change, and that bound is to do with human limitations. Um, but if I mean, okay, there are already people working on deep reinforcement learning controllers for industrial equipment like bulldozers and cranes, uh, and it works. So you can, there are now uh, AI controlled uh, 
sort of um, physical land moving equipment that can put together a wall out of large stones by picking them up and placing them and figure out how to do that. Sort of you give it a high level goal and it will figure out how to place the stones and more or less achieve it. It's very preliminary, but you could, you know, it's not we're not too far away from setting up the machines and then coming back uh, at the end of a weekend and, and having, you know, uh, some earthworks having been done. Now, once we reach that kind of scale uh, with moving the physical world around, it will change fundamentally how we think about the physical world. So right now we think about like social media or the internet as this fast moving, ever changing, fluid world where you don't really get your bearings. There's no stable landmarks, but the physical world, well, that doesn't change very quickly. You know, my road looks the same more or less now as it did three years ago. They resurfaced it maybe. The playground might get new equipment, but it's still where it was five years ago. Uh, but that's a function ultimately of human limitations, not a physical fact about the world uh, and our desire of how to allocate capital and machine time and, and the limitations of our machines. But as they become more capable, the physical world will look more like the digital world. It will be more fluid. It will change more rapidly and be less stable. Uh, and we'll come to realize that we had conservation, that is unchangingness of the physical world by default, as a, but it wasn't really like a, wasn't a, an, an axiom of the physical universe. It was a function of our limitation. Yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting, really quite profound point. The, 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 the slowness, and I, I, I mean, rate of change is, what is I mean, the rate at which things change, of course, is probably how you really want to think about it. But the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense in which certain things have a permanence. And I mean, I mean this in, in, in effective terms, not in literal terms. But there are, you could think of this, you could think of the world as loosely falling into a handful of qualitative categories. And you could you could measure the rates of change quantitatively, and it would be continuous, you know, from, from zero all the way up. Um, but you can imagine qualitatively that you know, in human experience, there are sort of things that that are effectively permanent, um, things that are uh, things that are dynamic but unchanging. So it's sort of like you know, oceans, rivers. You know, they're they're in motion, they're dynamic, but they're but at the same time, there is a there is a a um, a consistency over time, and then there are things that are slow. There, there are there's a there's a slow moving category. Things that things that move but move slowly. Um, things that do change but change slowly. Plants are maybe an example of that, right? I mean, the, plants aren't like a rock. Uh, the, a rock, for all practical purposes, from the human perspective, is static. Uh, plants move a little more slowly, but still noticeable. Um, then you have plants and animals, or sorry, then you have other kinds of animals um, uh, that, and, and human beings, of course, move quickly. And I suppose in human experience, you have some processes or some things that are, that are really, really fast. Certain insects move almost too fast to see. Um, uh, and, and then now we've created a new domain of machinery that, that, that properly does work at, you know, there are rates of change within machinery uh, that, that are, you know, go on up from there in many orders of magnitude um, with how fast they operate and how fast they change. And the it's interesting to see what things will move out of the move around in those categories um, as a as, techno, as technology advances um, and things that seem permanent in the uh, or we're, we're in basically the permanent category or the very slow category <laughs> um, could could very quickly shift into other categories and become things that. That can that can you know change much much more quickly. I love that, man. I just realized I mean, that's that one's going to be knocking around my head for a week or two now. I'm sure <laughs> I'm going to be looking around the world very differently. <laughs> <laughs> I might have some other ones, but uh, does anybody want to add? No, go ahead. Yeah. So another one I thought of was um, this one's a bit more entertaining. Bullshit is tolerated. So 
it's interesting to think about the the way that conversation has changed uh, as a result of everybody having phones in their pocket that they can use to fact check things. So there was a lot more bullshit of a certain kind before everybody had smartphones. I don't know if you remember, <laughs> but uh, people would confidently state facts uh, about you know, maybe they'd kind of heard something like a historical fact or a yeah. numerical fact, and people would be much more prone to confidently state it. Uh, not say, I kind of think it might be sort of like this, but just come out and say it. And I guess mostly it was guys usually. Um, that has really changed. So people are much less prone to doing that. And I can remember the transition <laughs> because... There was, you know, you'd be at quite a few social gatherings where people would say something and then someone else would get out their phone and check it and it was wrong. And there was like this moment of awkward silence and like, oh, yeah, OK. Uh, but people are just much yeah, less likely to that do that too. now. Um, so that's so bullshit of a certain kind has been uh, decreased as a result of having quick access to authoritative sources. Um now, other kinds of bullshit are, are less, uh, more resistant to just Googling the answer. Uh, but as, you know, okay, let's, let's suppose, for example, that we had a, um, a, an agent sitting next to us here, which we fed a transcript of our conversation, and then it's kind of commenting in the chat. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I say something about, oh, in, the, in China, you know, there's, there's such and such happened in 1980 and this means such and such for technology and then the bot in the chat just sort of quietly notes that actually this is a pretty superficial take on what happened in the 1980s and your interpretation is wrong for this reason and that reason um you know it's it's not some it's not something you could google right you can't google that someone's opinion is kind of shallow but uh if you had an expert around who could put into context what you're saying and then refute it with an argument the way that an interlocutor in a conversation would do. I mean, if you if you have a conversation with someone who knows a lot more history than you, you quickly feel a little foolish, right? Because you have some ideas and then they're kind of like, no, I don't think so because of this and that. And if you don't have at your command the same facts they do, you might be right, actually, but it's, it's rather hard to trump someone who just knows more stuff than you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so, <laughs> so that's that's a yeah, case. Yeah. yeah, so I could imagine that, uh, well, the flip side of, I mean, saying bullshit is tolerated is, is one side of it, but it's a kind of undermining of people's ability to feel agency in conversation um, uh, is, is maybe another way of putting it. And that's, it's sort of an, I mean, the assumption here being that, uh, it's, it's a subtle thing, right? So we're having a conversation here and there's, what, four of us and we have certain amounts of knowledge, but uh, we would talk differently and not have the same conversation if Henry Kissinger were here, right? <laughs> For various reasons, but um, there would just be a kind of like, we'd be a bit sheepish maybe to express our somewhat limited understanding of certain topics, knowing that a real expert was in the room. Um, but maybe a real expert could be in the room for 20 cents if we wanted fairly soon, right? Uh, so there will be changes to conversation, which are of the form, not I'll check in my f on my phone to see if what you're saying is correct, but let me bring GPT-4 into the conversation, pull out your phone, press on, and then it's listening and is kind of pointing out your, you know, uh, superficial understanding of quantum mechanics and explaining to you how your dumb ideas about how that fits into new age uh, philosophy are, are really very shallow. That's not how quantum mechanics works, et cetera, et cetera. So the same kind of experience you might get from an irritating friend um, who's willing to <laughs> to do that. You could, well, you could get it for free. <laughs> well, here's a very cynical uh, idea to follow on and add into that, Dan, which is um, if, the, if, it, if it becomes the case that, that facts become easily checkable uh and this has already occurred uh one might ask and, and, and then go out and observe the world in the social media landscape and see if it's already occurring um would this mean that conversation 
and would would in in the interest of safety uh, and not getting called out, would people gravitate more towards making unfalsifiable claims <laughs> in their conversations? That's the first thing. And then as a second thing, as a second thing, we can we could ask um, what sort of what sort of claims are unfalsifiable? And I'll give you a terribly disturbing and, and cynical example. Um, claims about other people who you don't know, claims about their intentions are unfalsifiable, right? Because you can't read you can't read someone's mind, right? So Elon Musk is doing all this crazy stuff right now with Twitter, and it's a lot of it's inscrutable. And and everybody's got an opinion about why he's doing what he's doing. But it's safe to voice those opinions because they're unfalsifiable, right? Facts, claims about facts, claims about you know the way the world is um, that could be that could be falsifiable. Those are much harder to make, and people do make those. And the world's full of you know, uh, bullshit of that kind and misinformation and disinformation as well. But I have definitely noticed uh, the tenor of the general tenor of conversations um, deteriorating when they when when people de when people devolve into attacking one another's in intentions. Um, in fact, I've, I've come to have it as a sort of personal principle that that whenever I see online a conversation devolve into claims about who, who, what a person or, or an organization or an entity's intentions are, I just, I just tune out. I, I, I disconnect from that conversation because that, those are unfalsifiable. They're unknowables. It, there's too much uncertainty there. And it's very easy to attack intentions as a straw man, right? That's super, super easy to set up, uh, you know, to Im, Im, impugn the intentions of an opponent, for example, as a straw man and then attack that. It, it, it's really, you know, um, juvenile uh, uh, argumentation and, and debate when that happens. Um, and and that I, I, my experience now, maybe I'm just a cranky old fart at this point, um, but I think that's just gotten worse in the era of social media. I think that, that we used to give people the benefit of the doubt about their intentions a bit more than we do now. And um, uh, maybe that was because we had to tolerate uncertainty of other kinds especially factual <laughs> uncertainty like whether or not somebody knew their shit well enough and you had all the facts now oh you have to be so careful because it's so easy to get called out um by somebody with a smartphone or as you were saying dan by a, a, a gpt bot um you know refereeing the conversation that the only safe things to say are unfalsifiable <laughs> claims about people's intentions um and uh man that sucks but oh, holy moly is that a recipe for toxicity in a conversation no so that's why I say it's a cynical take. <laughs> <laughs> what was your take, Matt? Imagine a world where this is the case, the, the, the GPT-4 example. Let's bring that into the conversation and, and so on. Um, I feel like that's probably... So, so with the, let me go back to the example of the fact-checking person with the smartphone at the social gathering. That's like a, that's like a move you can make in a social situation to say, well, actually, I believe that's probably wrong. So let me pull out my phone and let me, let me call you out and then see what happens. And that seems to have like, um, calling someone out seems to have kind of stuck as a, you know, a strategy that beats claiming a, a bad fact or whatever. And we've reached this new kind of equilibrium in um, social interactions where people are less uh, willing to um, confidently state something like that. Okay. Um, it's not clear to me how the social game is going to react to the introduction of this new possible, this new possible move that you can make which is bringing GPT into the conversation and getting an expert opinion on, um, on these opinions that are going around. So like, would people want that? Maybe they would avoid that. Maybe they would be like, you know what? I actually feel more comfortable having a conversation without that expert, um, listening to what I have to say, um, let alone like the privacy implications of that. Um, because for example, uh, you know, I, my, my gut reaction is it would be better if we 
it wouldn't necessarily be better if we had that constant influence of an um, established opinion voice kind of correcting everything that we say, because um, it could kind of be stifling for, for um, new, like how do you come up with a new unorthodox take on something that's maybe established knowledge or something like that. Um, it's one thing to become kind of more informed, but there also needs to be a space for ideas to kind of uh, grow and people to have half-baked ideas and to um, to talk about them with with friends and get get feedback and stuff um, in a kind of gentle way. Otherwise, these new opinions are kind of going to be stifled. But they may actually be like the the orthodox expert opinions may actually be subtly wrong, and so or they may be uh, incomplete or missing something. So it, it seems important that um, we have some ability to have naive conversations. And um, I, so one question is, if this possibility becomes available, will it actually be used? And another question is, should it be used? Um, or how should it be used? Or, you know, should it always be used? Yeah, I, I like that. I, maybe there should be a, an equivalent of the shallows or the mangrove swamp for small fish. So yeah. you, you do need to have a space where you're you can actually talk a bit of nonsense, right? It's not actually an ideal that in every conversation all the time, you only state completely factual things and you never explore ideas by messing around a little bit. That's, that's you know, maybe one. You know, this is what this is what this is. The, this is what the, the proverb, I don't know if it's quite the same in, in Australia, but this is what the bar was for. <laughs> for the longest mm -hmm. time in the U.S. I mean, you just you, you go and you get you drink a few drinks and you you it, it loosens your tongue a little bit and then people you know we have phrases like shooting the shit you know where and, and I think that there's a reason for having those those idioms you know it's it's where yeah you you have a place where you can go where you can kind of just spout off and drink and be disinhibited and and not be judged and not be scrutinized and then things are forgotten the next day. We, and, and, you know, it, 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 of course, that's one of the terrible things about the Internet, of course, is that you, drunken tweets haunt you forever, right? Um, whereas, you know, drunken nonsense you say at the bar last weekend, it's just gone. You know, it's just gone. Um, it doesn't haunt you forever. And, and uh, the, so there was a, there was a, a, social, a social outlet that built in a tolerance and a forgiveness, like you were saying, Dan, the shallows for, the, for that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, we, 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 we had, we had some longstanding social institutions perhaps serving those functions that have been a little bit, you know, displaced or eroded by, by um, new uh, social media, I suppose. <laughs> now we have meta uni seminars. <laughs> okay. Um, Where's the bar? Th yeah, that's right. You don't have a beer in your hand. I do. Okay. Um, Hey, the other thing is you can't record the, it, that they can't be recorded sessions, right? Because I don't want to come back to haunt you. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, okay, I had another one. Um, the world is intelligible. This is interesting because it didn't used to be true, right? So, uh, and you can tell that from the way we we think about. Um, the world beyond the sort of limitations of our social circles and our machines and our buildings. It, it used to be there's a dark forest and there are things going on in there that are mysterious and beyond human comprehension and maybe scary. Uh, now we have dark forests in movies, but you know, I, I've never been in a forest and felt like maybe there were monsters somewhere that I, you know, had to pay attention to. Uh, but maybe this is an interregnum that we're in where the world seems like it's kind of, I mean, it's not intelligible really, right? The nations with millions of people can't really be reasoned about. We're surrounded by institutions and organizations that are deeply mysterious to all the people in them. We don't really know what's going on, but that's not really what I'm talking about. What I mean is that we don't feel that there are agents in the world, like localized units that are small, like, animals or people that somehow uh, 
well, I suppose you could think about the, the population of dolphins and whales out there and we don't know what they're doing or what they're saying, but we think about that very differently. That's like a subject for biologists and, uh, and um, marine scientists to study. It's not so much anymore something that's mythological or deeply mysterious and kind of an indication of the world being beyond our power to comprehend given sufficient time and attention. Um, but we could soon repopulate the world with deeply mysterious things, right? whether they're AIs or just animals that we engineer or, uh, or just things are changing quite quickly. So, um, so an assumption based on human limitations, uh, I don't know how this fits into this category exactly, but, um, so, uh, Intelligible means intelligible to humans. So, yeah, this one is kind of maybe it's 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 so really the, the 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 version the version of this that is the you know if if we made the the fallacy of believing that the world itself is uh, mysterious when actually it's just unintelligible to humans, or the world is knowable, but really it's just the current world is understandable to humans yeah maybe it's it's kind of two things i'm saying one is that the human sphere has spread out to cover a lot of the surface of the planet so that we can basically live our lives more or less interacting with human products or things that are human clients so you know dogs cats machines uh we can organize our world so that we interact very little with things that are really beyond humans. So that's one fact. And then within that sphere of influence, most of the world is designed for us and intelligible to us, right? Things have buttons with labels. There are signs around. Machines come with manuals if we choose to read them. Pets are not very intelligent, relatively speaking. So they, they surprise us, but not in ways that we find deeply disturbing. Um, so that's kind of what I'm getting at. And both the sphere of human influence might shrink if there's other kinds of intelligence around. And within our sphere of control, the products of our intelligence may may not be very intelligible to us. So it, we, we may move more back into a period that feels more like the past where there really are dragons on the map and uh, uh, golems around the corner whose intentions we, we can't really judge. Well, I, I, I know <laughs> if, if, if it may be a, maybe there's a little bit of selection bias going on just in, in this group. Um, but the, the world is already massive. The human built world is already massively unintelligible. And it, I mean, it already that, so on the, on the one hand, in some sense for some people, the world is more intelligible than it was in the past, uh, you know, 500 years ago, for example. I think that's fair, perfectly fair to say. Okay, it, it, it certainly to in a general sense or to a first approximation. Okay, okay. But having said that, um, oh man, you know the how what, just your average person, and I include myself in this absolutely, has like next to zero idea how in the hell their smartphone works at all. It's just totally unintelligible magic to me. I have no, I know there's a battery in it and I know there's a computer in it and I know there's a camera and a microphone. And beyond that, I couldn't tell you anything. And so it's just, just completely unintelligible. And there, and so, and I don't just mean like machines like electronics, but so many things are that way. Many people don't have any idea how their government works. Um, uh, the, we don't know how things are made. We don't know where our food comes from. You know, it's it, 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 everything. Like that's exactly right. There's so much of our world is a black box now, and um, so I think the starting point. I, well, I agree with you, Dan, that, that the world will become more intelligible in some ways thanks to advances in in um, our scientific understanding of the world. Uh, for civilization as a whole, the, the world becomes more intelligible. For individual human beings existing within the world, if you assume we are our our current limitations persist out to some timeline, you know, before we're all upgrading our brains and everything, um, then uh, yes, the world will become, the human built world will become less intelligible as more and more black boxes of more and more marvelous capability emerge. 
but we're start we're not starting from from a from a really high bar already. Let's I, I guess that's my main point. We're, <laughs> there's there are a lot of black boxes and a lot of misunderstood things. Um, uh, and and then what's even worse than that, and and this is there. So I we, we were laughing about the bar a few minutes ago, right? Shooting the shit at the bar. There's always the guy at the bar who's mouthing off about stuff he has no idea about, right? Of course, because that's what the bar allows. Um, and so there, so it, it's not just that the world is unintelligible, but there are people who think they know how the world works or some part of it, and they don't. They've got completely the wrong idea. They're missing one. Um, uh, Such as so, all my political yes. enemies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 there are big categories of this. I mean, the, the entire, I mean, got, you know, bless them, my, my heart goes out. Uh, because I genuinely believe it's a psychological disorder, but the entire conspiracy thinking, conspiracy theorizing sphere, I mean, we're talking not at just a small number, millions or tens of millions of people around the world who general, genuinely believe they have an understanding of how things are operating and working, That, and of course it's deranged, it's, it's, it's delusional and, and, and not doesn't map to reality at all. Um, uh, so the, you could be worse than than mystified or uninformed you can be you can be laboring under uh under actively harmful delusions uh we can comment more on that one but i, I have another one that to, to take a different topic to ai for at least one of these um uh where is it right uh so assumptions based on human limitations only a small proportion of land is habitable slash land is scarce this is uh well we talk a lot about the influence of uh, property prices on behavior and allocation of talent and quality of life and all of that uh family formation there's plenty of literature on some some of the problem to do with uh, population growth or people not being able to have the sizes of families they would ideally like is uh, to do with property prices in many places um well why is why is land scarce in some sense it's not scarce there's lots of farmland around and it's not super expensive there are lots of places you could go and live and property isn't that expensive um, but still, we tend to congregate in relatively small proportions of the land area. You know, uh, in Australia, this is very noticeable. Um, there's lots of farmland, but lots of land that basically is just too arid to productively use for most people. Now, of course, there's animals on it. I'm not saying it's unoccupied or maybe it has value to uh, people as it is. So I'm not giving a normative judgment on it should be green and lush and, you know, suburbi suburbia. Uh, but there is a lot more land than we tend to think. You, okay, you fly across the U.S. and it's amazing how much is occupied in farmland. It's really stunning how much farmland there is in the U.S. But if you fly from the West Coast to the East Coast, the first couple of hours are just flying over what looks like complete desolate garbage land from the Mars, right? It's just desert or something like desert. Uh, but in principle, with sufficient energy... There's plenty of water on the planet. It's got salt in it, but with energy, you can get the salt out. You could do plenty of things with all that land. Uh, so in some sense, the scarcity of land or our sense that there is an infinite high quality green acreage out there waiting for us uh, is to do with technological limitations more than a fact about the world. I, I completely agree. Um, one thing to add into this is the the um, and this has already occurred uh, to a, a limited degree, and that's that human mobility, our ability to move, our ability to travel distant, you know, a given any given distance in any given amount of time, as that has uh, changed, as as we have become more mobile, um, our sense of space and distance in in Human, in practical terms, um, has changed. Um, places that are actually enormous, if you're on foot, feel small if you're, you can access uh, vehicles. And places, uh, and the US is criticized uh, heavily for this, of course, um, 
places that were once not habitable because they were too far away um, became habitable thanks to automobiles. And so suburbs and um, peri-urban, suburban, ex-urban areas and out into rural areas uh, at, at the distant periphery, those became viable places to have um, to have a home because it was it was possible within some reasonable and reasonable is debatable, but within some fairly manageable amount of time to travel from that place of habitation to some place of work, right? So you could live a hundred miles, which is an absolutely stupefyingly large distance if you're on foot, but you could live a hundred miles away from where you work every day. Um, and people do in the United States, if you have an automobile and you can drive for an hour and a half each way to get to and from your place of work and live a very, very long way away. And, and so that's a technological constraint. I mean, one could imagine, you know, at some point in the future, uh, autonomous aircraft that travel very fast could, you know, extend that radius of viability. And, and, and that's assuming you, you still want to access certain places. Um, now maybe it, but it might not even be for work. It could be that it, that you. It could be that psychologically, it feels like you're living near the big city as long as you're within 300 miles of one, because you can jump in a in a you know an automated air taxi and be there in 40 minutes or something like that. Um, you can be downtown in 40 minutes because the air vehicle moves 400 miles an hour or something like that. Um, one could easily imagine a circumstance like that emerging that would continue the trend that we that we began with automobiles. Um, so uh, there's an interaction certainly between our perception of the finitude of land uh, and the availability of energy to make that land habitable and the technology required to uh, to travel within and to and from that area of land. Yeah, I suppose also there were, if I'm thinking about the area where I grew up, uh, a large part of it is basically swampland, uh, was swampland, now is suburban uh, developments. That land wasn't really usable for human habitation until you could move large amounts of earth around and redirect rivers and, and, and so on. Uh, so it would have been perhaps pr very likely productively used by Aboriginal people. Uh, there would have been lots of animals living there that could be uh, could be hunted and other resources that could be gathered. So it would have been part of a productive sort of uh, sphere of human activity, no doubt. But it wouldn't have been a place that you could build habitation or, or regularly live in. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's land... Uh, sort of falls in cognitive categories that are based on the current level of technology. And we just, without much questioning, think of, well, there are large areas of the planet that are freezing cold and therefore uninhabitable or deserts and therefore uninhabitable. Um, but I remember uh, as an interesting scene in, I don't know which episode, but in Star Trek where they're, they're talking about well, in, in my time, the moon is green because there are millions of people living there. Um, and I thought that was a, uh, at the time, it kind of struck me as I never thought about that. Uh, I mean, obviously you can think about moon bases, but the moon being green somehow is being thought of as a place, like in the future, in that future, the moon was just another place where people were. It wasn't some distant forbidding territory. Um, and there are right now many places on earth that feel that way, but uh, that, that is just kind of an unexamined assumption, perhaps, that, that might go away. I, I think it's also, um, just while we're on land, um, the we have a fairly two-dimensional conception of land. I mean, we, the, the, and for obvious reasons, but the, 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 the surface of the Earth, where all human activity occurs, is just a vanishingly thin veneer on top of the entire volume of the planet, right? Um, and it, 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 I, I think, I think it's, it is remarkably difficult to build an intuition of just how much material is under our feet. Um, because we really are sort of flatlanders, right? You, you might, I'm, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that quite famous you know, sci-fi sci short story, Flatland. 
Um, it's about two dimensional beings. Um, and we're not far off of that, right? I mean, we're pretty close. Uh, uh, but the um, speaking of earth moving, um, I, I over the last six months, because of a summer project I was working on in, in, here in, in, in my home, um, I was doing some landscaping work and I gained a completely new appreciation for, for just how much volume of material there is. So when you try to, when you try to move earth with a shovel manually, any significant amount, um, it is, it's, it's just, it's mind blowing how much material there is and how, how massive it is, how much it weighs, like the, a cubic meter of, of soil is so much material and so heavy and so much work to shift even the smallest distance. And um, so I, I personally gained a, just a completely new appreciation for, uh, so anyway, just all I was to, to round out the thought very quickly, um, I don't think that we are going to, as a species, uh, you know, uh, anytime soon, be building deep underground hundreds and hundreds of stories or anything like that. But the scope is certainly there to, to explore a, um, uh, explore the, the third dimension, explore beneath us and above us to a greater extent than we have already. And in many, um, uh, places on the, 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 the near surface underground is very well suited to a lot of infrastructure that would be um, completely transformative. So for example, um, uh, you could easily, I say easily, in the, in the, in the science fiction uh, context, so in, in, in science fiction terms, it's straightforward to imagine undergrounding all transportation, for example. You could just, all road transportation. You, you, you could conceivably build a tunnel underground where every street is today, where every surface street or roadway on the surface is. That's not inconceivable. It's not even particularly far-fetched. It's just really, really expensive if you have to do it with, with current technology. But it's, 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 that, that's not, uh, you know, that's not building a Dyson Sphere. You know, building, building a thousand or even 10,000 miles of tunnels underneath a city like Los Angeles is not building a Dyson Sphere. It's, it's, you know, it, it's, 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 it's relatively plausible. Um, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of other infrastructure could go under there. I mean, we, we, we manufacture, um, all of our manufacturing facilities are built on the surface of the earth right now. But again, that's sort of to accommodate human beings because human beings don't like being underground like moles and, you know, it's expensive to dig out, you know, for underground and so forth. And, it's, and in the limit, it would be hard to figure out where to put all the material you brought up from underground. I mean, you have to have some, some uh, idea of what to do uh, with all of that stuff. Um, but you you could certainly imagine undergrounding a massive fraction of you know the productive the productive production base right of the of the, our civilization, and freeing up the surface of the land, of the earth for you know other use. So the idea that 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 uh, the ultimate destiny destiny of a technologically advanced civilization is to simply pave over the entire surface of the planet with urban landscape or buildings or something is pretty unimaginative. I mean, you know, you could imagine a society that would made that choice. And there have been lots of famous examples in, you know, in, in sci-fi, in the literature, Coruscant and Star Wars, and um, I forget what the home world and uh, the, center, the center of the galaxy is in foundation, but the, where the entire surface is just an, ur an urban area. Um, but that it just strikes me as unimaginative. Um, and, uh, you know, you could easily imagine an entire world just being wilderness. and and still having you know, orders of magnitude greater productive capacity than we have today and all of it being underground um, just for example so yeah on that note uh yeah matt contributed one in the chat uh which is the idea that nature is infinite and this we've come up across i mean this was a a theme of the 20th century 19th century uh, very much and maybe we're more attuned to it now but at the beginning, say with fishing or any other uh, cutting down trees, uh, it was easy to imagine that the scale of human activity would just not fundamentally affect the reservoirs that were there in nature. And of course, we came relatively quickly to, to appreciate that our activities were at a scale where that was not true. Um, 
But maybe there's further lessons to learn in that direction. It's a bit related to the conservation by default, I guess, where uh, not only, I mean, of, of course, we know and we understand every child learns over and over and over again in school about the capability of humans to send animals extinct, species extinct. Um, but we could, I mean, we will reach another order of magnitude of capability of, of reshaping the Earth. Uh, I don't know. And how will that feel different beyond our current? Uh, it feels like a topic that is perhaps over um, explained to young people, this capacity and its uh, potential for harm. But how, how could this cognizance of our capabilities be any more present? Maybe engineering new species would be a, a kind of additional level of power that would change this. Well, I can I can offer some thoughts on this. It's it's a it's a set of questions I've given quite a bit of thought to, um, but uh, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. If anybody else has any 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 thoughts immediately on this. Anybody else? Okay, um, well, uh, I have a new book coming out shortly, and one of the topics that I discuss in that uh, is, this, is the question of um, conservation versus preservation versus rewilding. Those are three broad categories into which uh, um, environmentally conscientious land use tends to fall. They're not the only conceivable ones, but they're, they're certainly the ones that we cover the most when we take students through environmental ethics um, in, in, in in you know undergraduate and, and graduate courses, and uh, the conservation ethic is is the is uh, I'll just very quickly run through it. The conservation ethic is the idea of uh, protecting the inte ecological integrity and and um, uh, possibly the geographic and geological integrity of an an area. It can be landscape or a, a volume of of um, marine biosphere, for example. Uh, but in any, at any rate, um, maintaining and protecting the integrity of that uh, ecological area for human use, in other words, in service of human interests, um, so that th that ecological area can continue to provide what are called ecosystem services. Um, so this is a utilitarian and instrumental uh, uh, perspective on the value of ecological integrity. It's, it, it, an area is, is valuable because of uh, how useful it is to human beings. Um, the preservation ethic uh, argues or, or, or views the value of an ecological area as, and the ecological integrity of an ecological area as innate or intrinsic, not instrumental. Not the, the, the value is. Um, the value of ecological integrity is self-evident under the preservation ethic. It is assumed, it's axiomatic, and that integrity um, uh, and the right to it, the right for it to persist over time um, is, uh, is, is, yes, it's in intrinsic is the correct word there. And so this is protecting nature for its own sake not for our use or purposes. Um, the rewilding category is different from preservation in that it involves an active effort. It involves active human intervention to determine the, the uh, meaning of ecological integrity in a given ecological area. What that means is that with rewilding, you have to make a set of choices about what the structure of the ecology ought to be. And so that's an ought versus an is sort of question, right? It's, it's a descriptive versus a normative kind of uh, uh, distinction. So with conservation and preservation, you can be agnostic about what the landscape ought to look like. You just leave it alone, or you exploit it in a way that, that doesn't rapidly um, uh, reduce the complexity of the biosphere that's there, for, or, or the, the um, ecosystem that's there, for example. But with rewilding, that's a different 
set of ethical questions. You have to make a choice about what the structure of the ecosystem ought to look like. And so if you were to take an example, I'll just pick an example near myself because it's easy. So there's lots of farmland where I am and there's a little bit of urban area. So take a piece of land that is now a large parking lot that 50 years ago was a farm or maybe an orchard, like an apple orchard, a cherry orchard. We have lots of those here. Um, 500 years ago, it was a it was a uh, climax forest, a temperate climax forest, um, with possibly a little bit of silviculture from indigenous um, uh, Aboriginal you know, Native American uh, populations, but but in many cases not. Or wind back, collect back a bit further. 15,000 years ago, there were two miles of ice on this land. And then 20,000 yeah, years should, ago, there was an we entirely go back to that. ecosystem. So this is, so, well, this is the question, is, is at each of those different points, and then you can have sort of just after the last ice age or just before the last ice age here, the, this ecological uh, structure of the, envi of, the, of the area here, they were completely different. There were different megafauna, different large animals, different species, different species at every trophic level, and animals and plants both. So the, 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 this landscape as a wilderness looked very different, even within geologically extremely short periods of time, not over millions and millions of years, but just over a few thousand years, right? So that, then it becomes a real question, if, if you were to undertake rewilding, to, to what time do you wind the clock back? This is a, 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 a difficult question. Um, and then if you presume you have the technology, which maybe we do, you were implying it, Dan, um, what if we could reconstruct you know, either de-extinct from tissue samples or perhaps, you know, construct Jurassic Park style facsimiles of um, previous uh, previous species. Should we should we restore, you know, the woolly mammoths to the landscape and mastodons to the landscape? Should we um, bring back the saber toothed cats? Should we, you know, how far back do we go? So this is, a, I mean, it's a, there, there are no clear answers to these questions. There's no clear right or wrong questions. Um, but uh, of course, what's fascinating is that they won't be just mere, you know, philosophical thought exercises for undergraduates um, to mull over um, uh, and for people to yak about at the bar and shoot the shit over at the bar um, for much longer, you know, within our lifetimes and, and uh, uh, you know, within, probably within a, a, you know, several decades, these are going to be practical questions. We're going to be confronted by them. I mean, we're going to have to answer them and we're going to figure, figure out, you know, um, we are going to have to figure out how to approach that challenge, how, how to answer these sorts of tough questions. Um, yeah, maybe I'll add one last one. Uh, this is one I think about a lot. It's sort of it's sort of come up um, in previous seminars, but uh, and that's the illusion of depth uh, from complexity. And I'll explain what I mean. But if you'll indulge me, I. There's a passage from a, a novel that I often think about when I think about this. I don't know if any of you know Gene Wolfe. He, he writes in a few genres, but mostly sci-fi or fantasy. I'm a big fan. Uh, he has a book called The Wizard Knight, which is his take on the kind of typical fantasy uh, hero's journey. Uh, and I'll briefly summarize it and then read a, a passage that I think is quite astute on this point. So... The main character, Abel, is a young boy in our world, and then he somehow gets into this magical world, and he uh, appears to be uh, a grown man, a very powerful, strong grown man, and he becomes a kind of knight and a typical kind of story. Uh, he falls in love with an elf, or uh, I guess it's the elf queen, who's from a world that seems like it's below ours in some hierarchy. Uh, and he goes on some adventures, and at the very end of the book, he finally is reunited with this um, elf queen. And uh, and there's a scene where the uh, Valfather in the novel, which is basically God, um, uh, is punishing him. So he's broken some oath uh, in order to save some people. So he was supposed to not use his powers, but he did. Uh, and, and then the following interaction happens. The Valfather gestured to Wiston. You've served your knight faithfully. Wiston is his squire, I guess. You must do him one more service. Bring his helm and set it on his head. So there's some magic helm, which if you put it on, you see the world as it truly is. So you see through all the illusions. Uh, so, right. Uh, Wiston did. Lovely Desiri, who's this elf 
queen that he's in love with, became a puppet of mud and leaves. That was horrible, but I had expected it. Blah, blah, blah. You see what you are surrendering, the Valfather said, and know to what it is you go. What will you do? I drew my dagger, pushed up the sleeve of my shirt, and cut my arm. Drink, I told to Ciri, and she bent and drank of my blood. Not a few drops, as elf often do, but great sobbing gulps, while I clenched and unclenched my fist so that human life flowed freely, never stopping until a small green-eyed woman stood beside me. I have to imagine this is from some kind of mythology. I, I don't know this story. I don't know where he got it from. Um, but often he's interpreting old myths. Uh, this strikes me as quite a deep observation so uh, about human psychology and relationships in that case, but you could generalize it. So there are many things in the world which appear meaningful and deep to us, but more or less because our perceptions are limited. So... Uh, the when you put on that helmet and you can see with the uh, the far-seeing eyes and see through all the depths of complexity and the opacity of of the world maybe things don't seem as meaningful anymore and uh, i've often worried out loud in this seminar what that will do to people when the the helmet is put on them or it's available to them through um, artificial intelligence so, yeah, I guess in general, I would say that a, an assumption based on human limitation uh, is kind of this illusion that things are more rich. Like we look around us and there's culture and we have lots of stories and there are games that we play and they feel difficult and they, they feel like they have some depth to them. Right. So personally, I was drawn to mathematics for that reason. Right. It feels like it's deep. There's kind of meaningful stuff there and you can push into it and it pushes back and you'll never get to the bottom of it. Uh, but that that feeling, it feels like it's a property of the world, right? It feels like mathematics is deep. I don't, I don't feel that it's an artifact of my limitations that it's deep. I feel that it is deep. But many of the things we feel that way about may in fact actually not be deep. Uh, like from some point of view, with the helmet on, so to speak. Um, and I do wonder the degree to which we're mature enough to see with that helmet on and uh, move forward anyway uh, and make real the depth that was an illusion before. Uh, so that's um, yeah one of the one of the things I I, I feel uh, is most relevant to me personally, uh, in, in, including my attitude towards mathematics when it comes to the influence of AI. Maybe there are other examples you can think about. Well, the, the perhaps the flip side, I don't know if it's a flip side or it's, it's sort of orthogonal, but the Plato's allegory, allegory of the cave, right? Um, where the, 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 it's sort of the reverse, which is that things look simpler and lack depth. And it looked two dimensional and flat and, and simple, just shadows on the wall. And that the 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 reality is is has more depth and has more complexity. Um, and that seeing that entails an a, you know an awakening and a, an appreciation of some sort. Um, so there's there's uh, yeah, I can kind of I see give up some those. things and get others. Yeah, it's um, I don't know. Um, It's tough to say because I mean you can you can also think of your own personal uh, growth and development from childhood to adulthood. I mean we've we've all been through that. We've all experienced that. It's difficult to cast your mind back, of course, um, to the way you perceive the world as a child. But I think it, it's fairly. I don't think it's uncontroversial, or rather, I don't think it's controversial. I think it's fairly uncontroversial to assume that for most of us, you know, we had a a shallower understanding. In view of the world as children, then, then and we've come to have a, a, a deeper view as adults. I'm sure there are exceptions and, and, and ways in which that's nuanced, but to you know, first approximation, it's very, probably fairly true. And of course, you could ask the question: you know, what, to what degree was that disillusioning and painfully, you know, and a painful process go through? And under what circumstances was that an enriching and and um, fulfilling process to go through? 
Yeah, I think that's right. And that's what this story is also getting at. I mean, it's in that case, it's the example of a significant other, right? You, I guess when you're young, you sort of have this idealized version of the opposite sex, and then you, you meet and you fall in love and you discover they're kind of horrible people, just like you're a horrible person. <laughs> but then you you learn to deal with that and, and it's, it's good anyway. Uh, I suppose you also discover with respect to your parents that your parents are people at some point, right? Before that, they're kind of idealized figures. Uh, if you have good parents, right. they're right. sources of support and warmth. And then at some point, I guess usually when you're a teenager, you discover that actually their opinions maybe don't make a lot of sense sometimes, or or maybe they're biased or just ignorant on some topics. And that's a bit of a shock, uh, perhaps. Uh, and then you learn to love them anyway, but in a different way, a, a sort of a more mature way. Um, so yeah, that's right. I mean, we have experience of that with our personal relationships, and maybe maybe there's a generalized process that looks like that. Um, I suppose another sort of gen broad category here uh, is the you know, the idea of heterogeneity um, versus uniformity, and uh, to what extent flaws and imperfections. Um, create uh, create interesting di uh, dif differences, and to what you know, to what extent are I mean? So is is it? I, I guess I guess my I guess I'll frame this as a question, which is for artificial intelligence, um, uh, flaws will not be as unavoidable. Um, shortcomings, lack of capacity, you know, uh, uh, undesirable qualities as we judge for ourselves, right? I mean, so, so a person can look at themselves and say, I wish I were different. Um, most of that, uh, well, let's not say most, but, but for, an, for a, a machine, an artificial intelligence, um, that th th those characteristics will not be nearly as immutable as they are for human beings today. And as a result of that, um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, flaws and, and, and weaknesses will be more voluntary if we have them. And difference, difference uh, may originate from, it may still continue to originate from flaws and shortcomings. That, that, those are things that make a person unique today. Um, it's a reason, and, and we're not all the same and we're very, human beings are really quite different from one another. And a, a substantial portion of that is um, not just in our different sort of um, uh, capabilities, but also in our very different quirks and oddities and faults and flaws and shortcomings, as we would judge them, not just necessarily just as other people would judge them, or, as, or according to any absolute standard, just as we, as we introspect and, and judge them for ourselves. So I wonder um, uh, what role, the, how that might change for artificial uh, in minds and artificial life that that for which flaws are, or for which their characteristics are not immutable, um, but are subject to intentional um, uh, intentional change or intentional assignment, I guess. And then to what extent are we likely to see difference in diversity? Will it be valued for the same reasons in the same ways? Um, and I would presume this isn't, I, my, as an optimist, I don't think this is likely to be a problem at all, because if you remove immutability, almost almost certainly you create a greater range of variation that can exist, right? Um, and so I'm not concerned that there will be a sort of some massive convergence towards a boring uniformity where every, every conscious entity is, is basically the same. That would be very dismal and boring. And, you know, there's some dystopian sci-fi that's like that, that suggests that we will all just converge on some single, you know, monolithic, uh, 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 you know, ideal, and the world will be very boring because everybody will be just look like a supermodel, but all the same. Um, I think that I, I'm more optimistic. And again, I think that shows a lack of imagination. Um, I think we're likely to be, you know, vastly, vastly variable. Um, uh, and over time, as well as, you know, at any given moment in time. But at any rate, it's, I'm just putting this into the conversation, this idea of, what does depth and complexity mean? And some of it may have to do with limitations and flaws, not just, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, some sort of functional capability or something like that. All right. Um, 
so here's an idea let's have a race <laughs> so if you want to detach from the orb let me on the subject of uh, the world being intelligible uh, come and have a look at this hey that looks really cool apologies for the lag spikes um, I don't know if you can see if your draw distance is far enough in the distance there is some white material some spires at the sort of yeah that way the way Chad is pointing so directly from here towards the convention center if you remember that so I suggest a race to the top of that and then we can finish the discussion as we wish so ready set go no resetting, that's cheating. coming up that way <laughs> so where's the water levels yeah the flood hasn't started I guess uh, it should it's random when the flood starts so I oh. guess it just hasn't kicked in yet but I'll I think I'll leave this account in the server most of the day, so it will flood at some point. Nice. Oh, yeah, he got it first time. You made it. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure where we were going, and I got lost twice along the way down in the Sun Fire roots. <laughs> yeah. This is cool. Yeah, it's definitely reshaped the landscape a fair bit. Is this permanent or are you going to roll it back? How does that work? <laughs> no, as soon as we quit, it'll be back to normal. Yeah. It. It'd be kind of cool to have permanent changes, <laughs> though. Uh, yeah, one of the, I guess that's one of the things that's the most artificial feeling about uh, virtual worlds uh, is, is when they don't really change. <laughs> oh no. Can I walk around here? Not falling. Oh, come on. Oh, good. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. That was a fun discussion. All right, guys. You... That was fun and wide ranging. I definitely, I, I'll, I'll bring beer next time just to <laughs> get more That's of a right. in the bar kind of session. <laughs> 